Hi, this is Lily DeHoyas Anderson, and you're listening to Choosing Glory. Thank you for joining me. We're talking about the book written by the editor and compiler of the Book of Mormon himself, the Prophet Mormon. His first six chapters written by his hand on the plates of Nephi. Brothers and sisters, I hope you have, like I have, developed a great love for Mormon throughout our study of the Book of Mormon. Maybe you remember that Elder Bednar mentioned in our recent conference that, and he was quoting from President Ezra Taft Benson, saying that included in the Book of Mormon, the things that were specific for our day, he saw our day. He saw us and our world and our lives and our challenges. And he, through the gift and power of the Holy Ghost, selected those elements of the great number of records that he had access to, to include that could bless us, that could be a sign of the second coming of Jesus Christ, the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, this record that is another testament to Jesus Christ, the most perfect book that is available to us and that we can grow closer to Christ through its pages and through reading and studying and living what is taught there through any other book. So brothers and sisters, I do feel that it's easy to love this prophet. All of them are amazing men and have given us gifts through their own records. There's a special relationship that we can have with Mormon and Moroni And I hope that our heart goes out to the tragic things that they witnessed and the great price that they paid to do the will of the Lord. We're going to talk about this prophet today. Let me pause for a moment and include my current event for this week. I'm sure most of you have heard about sleeveless garments now being available to hot and humid climates particularly Africa. I don't know exactly what the distribution plan is, but it has been a bit of a buzz around the internet, of course, and I think the Salt Lake Tribune had an article about it. I didn't read it. It was behind a paywall. I didn't want to pay for it because it's the Salt Lake Trib, and I am not really all that interested in their take, although sometimes it's kind of interesting to hear what these people say who are not our friends in so many ways. At any rate... It's out there. We now have available, at least in some parts of the world, and I do see the sensitivity to the saints in Africa in this change. Because of the climate, I know we have some pretty hot places in the United States. We also tend to have air conditioning. You know, some of the other countries also have some relief. I'm just saying for these reasons, it's okay for me personally to to think about this and say, this is going to be easier Also, there's a one-piece slip kind of garment. I think there's also a skirt that's available. But the slip is a one-piece garment that has all the marks in it for women who wear dresses all the time or most often. It's easier. And we're also talking about a continent that still has much of the population living in more primitive circumstances than we encounter in Western countries. And plumbing, hygiene, all those things are probably more challenging, undoubtedly more challenging in some of those areas. And I feel like it's a really wonderful thing to make it easier for people to take out their endowment in the temples of our God and to to honor that covenant and all the covenants that we make in the temple by having access to garments that work for them. I imagine it will be more widely available eventually. I don't know how that works. People manage to finagle things anyway, so I'm going to see them. I did want to say a couple of things that I thought were interesting. In an online article from the RNS, which is Religious News Service, I'm not familiar with that website, but it came up when I was looking for something. There was what they called an next Mormon survey that was done in 2022 and 2023. And in their survey, and I didn't look at details, I don't know if they had them in the article there, but somewhere I probably could have found them if I'd looked harder, what their kind of sampling methodology was, how they got their sample. 
how randomized it was, how large it was. I didn't look up all the details. But in their survey report, they indicated that just over half of the endowed respondents, so these are members of the church who have been through the temple, just over half the endowed respondents reported that they were wearing their garments at the time of the survey. A sad. What was really sad to see also were the generational differences in those respondents and what percentages shifted according to what generation they were in. And they used some of our common designations of generations. The baby boomers at the time of the survey, and this was apparently random, they weren't told in advance that we're going to ask you about these things. So it was just kind of catching them as a snapshot on a certain day that they took the survey. Of the baby boomers, 84% were currently wearing their garments when they answered the survey. Of Gen Xers, only 42%. That's half as many as the baby boomers. There's a real change from one generation to the other there. I find that to be sad. For millennials, the next generation, 36%. That was the lowest generation, 36% for the millennials. The Gen Zers came back up a little bit to 41%. So almost, but not quite the same as Gen X. And yet those are half as high as the 84% that were currently wearing their garments when they answered the survey of the baby boomers. So, well, we know not everybody is a full tithe payer. We know not everybody has a temple recommend. These people, I don't know that they asked them if they currently had a temple recommend, but they had been endowed. So it's sad that we are seeming to struggle as a people to honor this part of our covenant. The garment is a blessing, brothers and sisters. Do our children hear us talking that way or acting that way and feeling that way? I remember one of my children telling me that they were excited to go to the temple and they were excited to receive the garment and to wear the garment. And that made me happy to hear that there was this expectation that was pleasant and positive for this child who went through the temple before serving a mission. And I I was really happy to hear that. I don't remember necessarily saying it that way to my children. I hope you're happy to wear the garment, but I feel like at least he saw his father and me happily and cheerfully wear our garments. I think I've mentioned this before, but when we lived in Las Vegas, after a while in our first home there, we put in a swimming pool. Still miss those pools in our backyard. Oh, well. And I did mention to my children that in the hot days of summer in Las Vegas, and that's a pretty long season, when we would swim sometimes two or even three times a day, I told them, I hope you'll notice that after I get out of the pool, I'm going to jump in the shower and I'm going to get dressed. I'm going to put my garments back on and get dressed. I don't want you to think that I feel comfortable just throwing a cover up on and going about my business of the day or running errands in a cover up because I'm going to get in the pool again later. I'm not trying to condemn anybody here, brothers and sisters. I'm just saying that I was wanting to just make sure that my children noticed that I wanted to wear the garment of a holy priesthood. I wanted to be clothed in that way that reminds me constantly of my covenants. I want to have that taking on myself the name of Jesus Christ and the power of the Savior to make me fit for the presence of my Heavenly Father and fit for the kingdom. So they did see me do that. And it wasn't the most convenient thing to maybe shower two or three times a day so that I could get dressed again as I participated in the regular activities and then maybe hopped in the pool again later. But it was a privilege, and it is a privilege, for us to have our covenants and this reminder of our covenants. The world makes a mockery of these things. I hope we never do that. I hope our children see us love keeping our covenants, wearing the garment. I hope that they prepare themselves for that. Does this change the laws of modesty? Not one whit. 
well, okay, maybe we used to then say we've got to have a sleeve and maybe at some point those garments are going to be available here and they are in Africa and so, okay, <laughs> those minor adjustments notwithstanding, I hope we don't fall into categories of people who think that this means that the church no longer cares about modesty. Brother Brad Wilcox gave a lovely speech in our last conference about the First Strength of Youth pamphlet and how it was intended to help us be higher and holier and help our youth more willingly and with their own choice and agency align themselves with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and his standards and how, in his estimation, <laughs> some definitely took that the wrong way and decided that meant it doesn't matter anymore if we're separate from Babylon. It doesn't matter if we blend in with the world. God has never told his people to blend in. He has always set us to be a thing apart, a people apart, a peculiar people, a peculiar treasure who do make sacrifices and obedience in order to honor him and honor ourselves and the covenants that we have made and to honor the potential that is in us to become like our Savior Jesus Christ and ultimately joint heirs with him. Okay, remember, it's interesting to see how things shift, right? Because back in 2019, they removed the language of wearing the garment day and night from the Temple Recommend interview. Again, I would suggest that that's the same kind of thing Brother Wilcox was talking about. This was not an invitation to live the standards at a lesser level. It was an invitation to say, you know what this is about. You know how they teach us in the Temple. So willingly keep your covenants. And yet... This year, earlier this year, they put that phrase back in the Temple Recommend interview, that it's phrased a little differently than it used to be, but basically it's, are, are you wearing the garment as instructed in the Temple day and night? So again, obviously there are reasonable times to remove the garment, and that's appropriate. This isn't supposed to be a prison for us and make our lives more difficult, but if there's a bit of a sacrifice involved in defaulting towards the wearing of the garment. Brothers and sisters, how fast can we pay that price? This is one of the lesser prices of the kingdom of God. There is much more required than altering the way we dress. So I did think about this, and forgive me, all of you who know research, because I'm going to be a little bit loose on this. In research, we talk about type 1 and type 2 errors. And very simply put, the type 1 error is finding a false positive. Like you do your study and you collect data, analyze it, and then you compare it with your hypothesis. And if you agree with your hypothesis, but it turns out that the hypothesis later is found to be wrong, then that's a type 1 error. We thought it was actually proved, but it really wasn't true, or somehow our data were off, or our analysis is wrong, or, you know, collection, methodology, whatever went wrong. So type 1 error is a false positive. Type 2 error is a false negative, where we reject the hypothesis and later on find out that, oh, actually, that hypothesis was a good one, and it does fit data. And when we repeat those tests and do those modelings again, we find that actually the hypothesis was true, but we rejected it. So, okay, that's a little detour about type 1 and type 2 errors in research. But it made me think about that because I thought, in a way, we can make type 1 or type 2 errors when changes like this happen in the church. So this is just my thinking. Forgive me here for sharing a little bit of this, which may seem strange, but I think there's a point here. I would say that maybe we could say that the type one error when these policies change or there is a modification made to the garment would be to be turning handsprings and saying like, wow, you know, this is the church is finally yielding to our pressure or the church is finally giving up on some of its old outdated standards and all of that kind of stuff. Now, I think there are going to be some uh, Julie Hanks, perhaps, and some of her followers are going to think that way. I would guess, anyway, that there are lots of people who are going to like, oh, yes, this was outdated. I was just hanging on by a thin thread in trying to comply with this requirement. And what makes me sad about that is that it's like living our lives 
with our nose pressed up against like a candy store window of Babylon. Like we're not happily or joyfully living our covenants. We heard a lot about joy in conference too. We're not joyfully and happily living our covenants and being obedient. We are hoping it will change. As I said, hanging on by our fingernails, hoping things will get easier or that they will change some of the commandments or change some of our standards so that we can have an easier time. That seems like that's a pretty serious error to me. If we are seeing the covenants and the commandments of the church and the standards of the church as this huge burden that has to change. Otherwise, you know, we're going to keep losing people and we have to accommodate. The other, let's say, type two error might be being overly rigid and getting kind of bent out of shape and feeling stung that the church is is making this change and maybe thinking like, oh, see, there they go. They're caving in. They're appeasing. They're just doing this to satisfy people who are just on the edge of leaving or losing their way. And I think that would be an error too. I actually heard this and I, <laughs> I know I was puzzled by it when I heard it, but I know it was true that there were some people who were upset when we had the change from a three-hour block of church to a two-hour block of church. I don't know why anybody really wanted to go for a third hour necessarily. Not that we couldn't enjoy being there for a longer block. But it's that sort of rigid thinking that I'm trying to warn against, thinking that this is the only true and living way to run a church block. Again, did people feel that way when we went from two meetings a day to one I don't know. Did people in pioneer days, or I'm not sure when these changes happened, it would have been post pioneer days, but when they changed from the garment that used to go to the wrist and to the ankle, and when they changed them to modernize a little bit to a short cap sleeve and a knee length or thereabouts, did people protest? Did they get stuck in their rigid way of thinking the church has to always do things in exactly the same way? Now, we're not talking about <clears throat> changing the sacrament. We're not talking about changing the sacrament prayers or no longer using bread and water for the emblems of the sacrament. We're not talking, although it does say that Christ will come and drink the new cup of wine again, so maybe there will be a more pure, healthy form of wine again. And again, that, hopefully that doesn't shake us in our boots. I don't want us to be rigid about how Christ teaches us to live the laws. We're not talking about changing the order of family here, although I suspect that there are some people in the type one error group who are thinking, great, this is just the harbinger of things to come, and now they're going to change the LGBTQ standards and marriage will no longer be between a man and a woman. That's not my understanding, but we can see how these are different kinds of errors being overly pushy about we've got to be more like Babylon, more like the world, or overly rigid and upset about modifications that might be made. I hope we don't follow in either of those groups. I did want to say this about the type one error group, according to my little model here, that idea of being fixated on being more like the world, hoping for things to catch up, so to speak, with modernity and with current worldly opinions and more secular opinions, makes me think that of that phrase that we've used forever, right, about being in the world but not of the world. And it makes me wonder, in some ways, is that a group of people who might be in the church but not of the church? who they want to be in the church, but they haven't given their heart to doing things in the way that Christ has taught us through his prophets, through scripture, but also through the living prophets. Are we not fully invested in that identity of being a peculiar people? That's something I hope that we'll think about, talk to our children about, discuss with them what that looks like to be in the church and of the church. 
And then again, with the type two error group, I would say that it could help us maybe to review what is it that constitutes my identity as a child of God, a child of the covenant, and a disciple of Christ? Am I locked into a certain way of thinking that this exact style of a garment constitutes my identity as a church member, as a disciple of Christ? Or can I realize that ultimately, what is it that identifies me? Am I reflecting the light of Christ? Do I have his image in my countenance? Am I working diligently towards those ends? Am I seeking sanctification and the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost? Am I trying to receive revelation for how to live and how to build the kingdom, how to rise to a higher and holier way? It's great time to think about and review what constitutes our identity as children of the covenant, as disciples of Christ. Okay, let's talk about the prophet Mormon. This is a prophet that I do have a lot of tenderness toward, although I can't think of one that I don't love in this great record. But he had a remarkable life. I saw an interesting article. I was looking up one thing that I wanted to check on, and it was something that I was pretty confident about, about Joseph Smith being visited by the prophet Mormon and Moroni. Of course, we know that he had interaction with Moroni. But I remembered hearing, and I think Lucy Max Smith mentions this in her history of Joseph Smith, that there were many of the prophets of the Book of Mormon who came to Joseph Smith during the translation time and that he would actually share with the family at the dinner table or in the evenings, he would share with the Smith family details of their dress and their weaponry and how they lived in their civilizations and waged war and lots of details of life in the Book of Mormon era because he saw people who had created these records. Now, I actually do have a copy of that book by Lucy Max Smith, and I didn't bother to go there and look it up, but I do remember that. I'm sure some of you have seen that. But in my kind of checking, just to make sure I wasn't giving false ideas here about the visitations to Joseph Smith, I found something else that I wanted to share. It was an interesting article that talks about parallels between the Prophet Mormon and the Prophet Joseph Smith. And they put it really nicely. This is found in the website of the BYU Religious Studies Center. The article is by John M. Butler, and the nice title of this article is The Author and Finisher of the Book of Mormon. The Author and Finisher of the Book of Mormon. So I'm just choosing some of his selections from that article. You could go and check out the whole article, and I think you would enjoy it. But here are some selections. In the church, we speak of Jesus Christ as the author and finisher of our faith. And this is mentioned, of course, coming up in the book of Moroni, the Son of Mormon, chapter 6, also in Hebrews, chapter 12. This paper examines and compares Mormon as an author and Joseph Smith as a finisher of the book of Mormon. It's nice and poetic, I think. Perhaps no other prophet personifies the preparation and achievements of Joseph Smith better than the prophet Mormon. He was a type for the prophet Joseph, foreshadowing Joseph's life and important mission. And then some really nice things. I think sometimes he stretches a bit, and that's okay. He's making a point, but I do think he makes some really nice comparisons. In their youth, they were both sober children. We read that right here in chapter one of the book of the prophet Mormon. Let's just read verse 1. Now I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard and call it the Book of Mormon. So his book within the larger book that he compiled. And about the time that Amaron hid up the records unto the Lord, he came to me. Now Amaron was the son of Amos, who was the son of Amos, who was the son of Nephi, who was, you know, that was that prophetic dynasty that goes all the way to Amos and then Amos, the son of Amos, and then to Amos's brother Amaron, who kept the plates, and didn't have anyone to pass them off to, apparently, that was grown. So he 
Amaron came to Mormon in Mormon's early youth. He's 10 years of age. And I began to be learned, somewhat after the manner of the learning of my people. And Amaron said unto me, I perceive that thou art a sober child and quick to observe. Okay, back to this article by Brother Butler. Lucy Max Smith describes Joseph Smith in his youth as remarkably quiet and well disposed. So maybe a comparison there. Both at around age 10, 11, moved further south from where they had their early youth because their fathers relocated. And we have that noted here. Verse 6, I, being 11 years old, was carried by my father into the land southward, even to the land of Zarahemla. And you know that Joseph Smith started out in Vermont, and then his family moved south to upstate New York. So similarity there. Mormon has a personal visit from the Lord at age 15. Let's, let's check that out. Verse 15 of chapter 1 in Mormon's own book, I, being 15 years of age and being somewhat of a sober mind, therefore I was visited of the Lord and tasted and knew of the goodness of Jesus. Now that's a pretty nice parallel. It was Joseph's 15th year. He was 14, so his next year, he's in that year when he has the first vision. Not exactly the same press, but not far off. Mormon was ministered unto by the three Nephites, and we read that later on in his book in chapter 8. And he has mentioned that previously. Remember, that was a side comment earlier that he was had been visited by the three Nephites himself, and they had ministered unto him. So we know that, and he repeats that in his chapter 8. Joseph was tutored by numerous heavenly messengers. That's the part I wanted to just sort of verify so I wasn't passing along something anecdotal. H. Donald Peterson has listed 59 such personages who appeared to the prophet Joseph or were seen by him in vision. 59. In fact, President John Taylor stated, when Joseph Smith was raised up as a prophet of God, Mormon, Moroni, Nephi and others came to him and communicated to him certain principles pertaining to the gospel of the Son of God. And that was in the Journal of Discourses. And he later said that Joseph seemed to be as familiar with these people as we are one with another. That is remarkable. And I did remember Lucy Mack talking about that a little bit. I love this statement by John Taylor to clarify also. Visits by the authors of the words he translated prepared Joseph to bring forth the Book of Mormon. In compiling the plates which bore his name, Mormon may have likewise been visited by the authors of the words he abridged. And we don't know that. There's no record, but it's an interesting supposition. And it could have very well been that same way. Joseph receives visits so that he's familiar with the men who wrote this book as he translates it and restores the gospel of Jesus Christ, wouldn't it have been interesting and maybe logical that the prophet Mormon, as he was condensing the record of these great prophets that came before him, had been visited by them to give him a glimpse into what their messages were and how to synthesize that through inspiration into the Book of Mormon. It's a nice thought. In his 24th year, Mormon is told to record his observation of Nephite society on the plates. I won't look that one up, but it's certainly here. You've read that. In Joseph Smith's 24th year, he translated the Book of Mormon. So at age 24, Mormon puts it together. He begins this work of recording his own observations, and Joseph Smith is translating at that age. Mormon, now this is a big difference, saw the end of his civilization. Joseph Smith's ministry was the beginning of a new civilization, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which will stand in the Promised Land through the millennium. Mormon saw the Dark Ages begin. Joseph Smith saw them end. That's nice. I liked that article by Brother Butler. A little bit more from it, I guess, I've got here. It is not by accident that Mormon, the author, and Joseph Smith, the finisher of the Book of Mormon, have so many parallels in their lives. Today we may draw nearer to Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith, because of the efforts of Mormon and Joseph Smith, the
the author and the finisher of the Book of Mormon. I think that's poetic and lovely. Thank you, Brother Butler, for those interesting ideas about the parallels between these two men. Obviously, those parallels you know, diverge in some respects. Joseph Smith lived a relatively short life of 38 years, and Mormon lives into his 73rd year, I believe. He's about 73 at the time of the end of the Nephite nation. I could be off by a couple of years, forgive me. But he's into his 70s before he dies in battle. Okay, we talked about some of these mentions in chapter one about Mormon's life in his early youth. And then in verse 13, we're going to go back a little bit and just pick up on some of the other statements. Verse 13 of chapter one, wickedness did prevail upon the face of the whole land. This is a dark time, as Brother Butler referred to it, dark ages, insomuch the Lord did take away his beloved disciples, and the work of miracles and of healing did cease because of the iniquity of the people. Verse 14, and there were no gifts from the Lord, and the Holy Ghost did not come upon any because of their wickedness and unbelief. Do we think it was any different then? that the Holy Ghost was less important to spiritual survival in any age of the world? It is certainly necessary now. Our prophet admonishes us continually to become closer to the Holy Ghost, to become sanctified, to seek his constant companionship and the fullness of the Holy Ghost. They needed it too, but because of iniquity and sin, it could not happen. They limited their access to healings and blessings and miracles and the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost cannot dwell in unclean tabernacles. Remember that we have been warned by the Savior himself that the Spirit will not always strive with man. We can receive or we can reject. It's our choice. It's our choice. And when a society wholesale makes this choice, and this is not the first time this has happened, we're going to read about the Jaredites. It happened to them. We know that it happened in the times of Noah. We know that it happened to the Canaanites. And that's why the Israelites were given the command to wipe out the Canaanites. They didn't complete that work, but the Canaanites were corrupt. Little children could not come into those societies with a hope of having the light of Christ remain with them and grow into what could be eventually the Holy Ghost. The light of Christ was extinguished because of the scene of brutality and evil and iniquity that was constantly in society and in their face. This is not going to happen. We've talked a lot about the parallels of this time with today, and there still are parallels that we're going to see as we study the words of this wonderful prophet in his own book. But there are divergences as well for which I give God thanks and gratitude to live in a time where the gospel will never be fully taken from the earth again. Can we limit our ability to receive blessings and miracles and the Holy Ghost? Yes. Individually, we can shut him out. We can shut out those great opportunities and blessings that are available to us. But collectively, there will be some in the church who remain faithful I hope it's many, maybe it's 50%, like the five wise and the five foolish virgins who are all waiting for the bridegroom. Notice that that's not members and non-members. We know this, right? These are all people who are members of the church, who know that he is coming, but five are prepared and five are not. And what is the difference that is given to us in the DNC? Must be section 45. I'm not going to check that right now. I apologize, but I think it's section 45 that says the wise took the Holy Spirit for their guide. Isn't that what our prophet is telling us to do? Isn't that what the scriptures keep telling us to do is to seek the companionship of the Holy Ghost, to sanctify ourselves. And of course, it is a gift that comes to us. But in the Doctrine and Covenants, that's the phrase that is often used, sanctify yourselves, meaning qualify for this great gift of the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost and the birth of fire, that we can be born both of water in baptism and born by the Spirit in the fire of 
the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost that can cleanse us of impurity and make us fit for the presence of Christ himself and eventually the Father. Anyway, all of this is connected. All of it's connected, I hope. That's exciting to see and witness again that we can embrace these things or we can reject them. But we do live in a time where not all will reject. And that is a great gift to live in a time that the gospel will not be fully removed. And why? Because there will be a faithful group of people who learn to live celestial law, who choose glory, who choose to become Zion ready. Mormon gets this at age 15. He is visited by the Lord. That is because he qualified for sanctification. 15, brothers and sisters, our kids can do this too. Not to pressure them, not to pressure them, but to help them understand that these things are available. That They don't have to wait until they are older to be on this path of covenant keeping and seeking the Holy Spirit in their lives as a constant companion, they don't have to wait. It can come in their earlier years. This isn't about pressure. This isn't about shame or making anybody feel bad. It's about inviting and helping them see the great blessings that come that our Heavenly Father makes available to all who seek him and all who receive him. And if we receive Christ, we receive the Father. If we receive the prophets, we receive Christ. We've been taught this again and again. Verse 16, how tragic is this? I did endeavor to preach unto this people, but my mouth was shut. And I was forbidden that I should preach unto them. For behold, they had willfully rebelled against their God. But I did remain among them. Verse 17, but I was forbidden to preach unto them because of the hardness of their hearts. And because of that, the land was cursed for their sake. And Gadiant robbers were back in verse 18. And treasures that are hidden in the earth become slippery because the Lord had cursed the land. We saw that before, prior to the destruction that heralded Christ's visit to the Americas. And there were sorceries. Last verse of chapter 1, verse 19, sorceries, witchcrafts, magics, the power of the evil one was wrought upon all the face of the land, even unto the fulfilling of all the words of Abinadi and also Samuel the Lamanite. The prophets speak the words of God, and every jot and tittle is fulfilled. Now, chapter 2 gives us another perspective on this remarkable man, this amazing prophet Mormon. He is 16 years old when he is appointed to be the commander of all the armies of the Nephites. I mean, I know some remarkable young people. I had... 16 year olds in my seminary classes and there were some that were pretty large in stature and spiritual stature as well i don't know that they would have had that opportunity of course our system is kind of different now but can you imagine what charisma must have flowed off this prophet as a young man at age 16 grown men choose to follow him as their commander in the military. This was a remarkable man. I mean, you could also, I think one of the parallels Brother Butler mentions in his article about the author and finishers of the Book of Mormon is that uh, Joseph Smith also led the Nauvoo Legion. So he also had some military experience, but okay, it's different. Mormon's experience was phenomenal for such a young man to be given that kind of responsibility and to have people willingly follow him. I'm in awe of that kind of personal power that, that comes from goodness. And even though these people are unrighteous, they recognize who he is and how he is and that he has the spirit with him and they feel protection from that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in part two. And anyway, it starts to talk about how the Lamanites came on us with great power and they frightened the armies and they wouldn't fight and they started retreating and all this kind of stuff. So he talks about the beginning of these end battles of the civilization of the Nephites and how the Lamanites ultimately destroy them. Verse 8, Behold, the land was filled with robbers and with Lamanites, and notwithstanding the great destruction which hung over my people, they did not repent of their evil doings. Now, the prophets warn repeatedly 
It's not just once that the Lord calls. It's again and again that he calls. It's again and again that he issues calls of repentance. We heard it again in conference. A call to repent. A call to become Christ's people. To become a more holy people. The prophet has been saying this for a long time. All the prophets have been saying this. Our other leaders are saying this. They are quoting the scriptures that have always said this. Repent and come to Christ and be saved. They didn't listen. Their hearts were hard. They are experiencing the beginning of the end. And there's still years to come, but they are suffering losses at the hands of the Lamanites. And it talks about how brutal that was. And behold, all this was done and the 330 years had passed away. Now, Mormon is about 20 years old now. And it came to pass that the Nephites, this is verse 10, began to repent of their iniquity. Now, let's not get too excited. And began to cry, even as had been prophesied by Samuel the prophet. For behold, no man could keep that which was his own. Remember, the land is slippery. For the thieves and the robbers and the murders and the magic art and the witchcraft. So people are losing their possessions. They're losing their ability to have a stable life, a safe and stable and secure life for themselves and their families. Verse 11, thus there began to be a mourning and a lamentation in all the land because of these things and more especially upon the people of Nephi. And it came to pass that when I, Mormons, saw their lamentation and their mourning, this is heartbreaking to me, and their sorrow before the Lord, my heart did begin to rejoice within me. Now, when I was you know, young and through one of my early readings of the Book of Mormon. I remember being a little puzzled by that, that Mormon sees their sorrow and lamentation and their mourning and his heart begins to rejoice. It caught my attention in a moment. I'm like, wait a minute, why is he happy that they're miserable? But it makes perfect sense because he explains knowing the mercies and the long suffering of the Lord, therefore supposing that he would be merciful unto them, that they would again become a righteous people. He understands the gospel of Jesus Christ. He understands that Christ is mighty to save. And he understands that Christ's arms are extended all the day long. He wants to save us. He wants to succor his people. He delights in those things. He wants to gather us as a hen, gathereth her chicks under her wings. It's only... on our side that we reject that he doesn't reject us we just have to embrace what he offers otherwise he cannot save us in our sins and this is what mormon goes on to clarify in verse 13 behold this my joy was vain he knew that if the people repented they could be forgiven even after years of iniquity Hardened hearts, if they came with broken heart and contrite spirit to Jesus Christ, they could be saved. For their sorrowing was not unto repentance because of the goodness of God, but it was rather the sorrowing of the damned. That is a poignant and painful phrase. The sorrowing of the damned because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. We can't get away with it anymore. That is why they are mourning and lamenting. Not because God is good and he will take us back if we return with fruits meat for repentance. But because I can't eat, drink, and be merry. I can't serve my natural man and let it run amok to the fulfilling of whatever appetite, however perverse, and however hurtful to others, I can't do that and get away with it anymore. I can't have my cake and eat it too. I can't be a law unto myself and receive the blessings of protection and goodness and health and stability and safety and security anymore. I can't have it. I can't have it my way and have the rewards of righteousness. It's tragic. This is a tragic part of our whole record here, that these people are mourning and lamenting, but they won't repent. They're only sorry that the consequences are catching up with them. The sorrowing of the damned, because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. Verse 14, they did not come unto Jesus with broken hearts 
and contrite spirits, but they did curse God and wish to die. Nevertheless, they would struggle with the sword for their lives. So they'd given up on one hand and the other hand, I'm not going down without the fight, but I won't repent, which would be and always is the only safe and sure path. The path that does ultimately and enjoy. We pass through sorrows, brothers and sisters. We pass through tribulation. There are refining trials. The Lord chastens his people. He refines us in the furnace of affliction. But there is a fullness of joy waiting for those who persist in the covenant path, who are diligent, not perfect on their own strength, but they become perfect in Christ because they choose Christ and they keep choosing Christ and they reject the world. They reject Babylon. They don't desire the fruits of Babylon. They desire the fruits of the kingdom. Verse 15, it came to pass that my sorrow did return unto me again. And I saw, these are also poignant words, that the day of grace was passed with them. The day of grace was passed with them, both temporally and spiritually. For I saw thousands of them hewn down in open rebellion against their God and heaped up as dung upon the face of the land. And he gives the year again, so he himself is about 33 years old now. He's 11 years younger-ish than, than the years of the calendar. We learn that on the first page of his book. There's an asterisk when he talks about being a certain age, when he talks about being 11 in verse 6. The asterisk takes us to a little footnote that says about A.D. 322. So if you subtract 11 years from the year that Mormon chronicles in his record, we get an approximation of Mormon's age. And because I was interested, so interested in his life and how he observed the fall of this civilization, in my margins in red pencil many years ago, I put his age occasionally, not every time that the year was mentioned, but periodically to kind of keep an idea and a visual in a way of how Mormon's life is progressing as he sees this sad ending to his people. So he's about 33 years old at this time. And in the next verse, he's 34. It came to pass in the 340 and fifth year, the Nephites began to flee before the Lamanites. Now, it's not the last time they have a victory, but they are on a downhill path because they will not repent. Now, I'm going to just talk a little bit about this before we end part one. Let me talk about this godly sorrow. I've mentioned this not that long ago. I don't remember which episode we were talking about godly sorrow or repentance. But it reminded me of a video that I'm pretty sure I mentioned. It was a seminary video that was new back in the day that I was teaching. And it's pretty old now. But I looked it up back then and it's on YouTube. You can look up godly sorrow. You could even put in Aaron Eckhart, you know, who's become, you know, a Hollywood actor and has had several big films. He was raised a member of the church, attended BYU. He might even still be a BYU fan, some people say. At any rate, he's become secular and he's no longer active, which is a shame. But he was in that production. So I think he was still either a BYU student or fairly young, still active in the church when they made this movie, Godly Sorrow. So he is the boyfriend and the fiancé in this video. And his fiancé, the girl he's going to marry, is going to her bishop for her temple recommend interviews to have the recommend for marriage in the temple. Charles Metton plays the part of the bishop, and Charles Metton actually was a professor in the drama department at BYU, and he was my bishop for a while when we were in the Edgemont Fifth Ward in Indian Hills in Provo. My parents were teaching at the Y. So it was kind of fun to see him in that part when I was a, a teacher and he was playing the bishop, talking to this girl, and he asked if she had anything that she needed to repent of that had not been cleared up in the appropriate manner, a moral transgression that required the process of the church and working with her bishop. And she does divulge that she did have an unrepented 
sin, moral transgression. They don't go into detail, of course, which is appropriate. But there was something that she hadn't cleared up with a bishop, and now she brings it forward, and her bishop says, well, let's pause things for a moment. And she's very distressed because the bishop is postponing the completion of her temple recommend to be sealed in the temple to her fiancé. And she has to tell her fiancé about that and her parents because as she expresses to the bishop in real distress, I think the invitations are sent out, you know, the reception is planned, everything's ready to go forward, and she hadn't talked to her fiancé about this before, and now she has to break his heart a little bit, and she can't stand it. You know, she does those things because the bishop's not going to give her a recommend until this is appropriately cleared up. And when she is meeting subsequently with a bishop, you see this sort of mulish look on her face as she sits there in front of his, you know, he's in, at his desk and she's there, you know, <laughs> with this sort of stubborn, unhappy look on her face. And yes, her heart has been broken, that the plans have to be postponed, that she had to... <laughs> have this sort of public moment where people shame on them gossip sometimes or make judgmental decisions about people at any rate it was hard for her and i i can only imagine and i'm sorry when people go through hard things like that but we don't want to make a mockery of god or his temple so the bishop is trying to help her so that she can come in a clean way to the altars of the temple, that she can come with a clean hands and a pure heart and not make a mockery of these sacred things. And we've talked about how we're seeing too often girls that come in dresses, wedding dresses. Well, they don't, can't wear them for the ceilings, but they change into them to go take pictures and they aren't even wearing their garments. I mean... There is mockery happening, brothers and sisters. Let it not be us. Let it not be of our house. Let us not encourage or teach that that doesn't matter. Let's teach the opposite. At any rate, she finally works it through. And at the end, the bishop, though, makes the point. He says, I think you're sorry about the wrong things. Exactly the point of the prophet Mormon here. I think you're sorry about the inconvenience and the embarrassment. But are you sorry because this separates you from God? because no unclean thing can enter. And I can help you, basically. I can help you approach the Lord in worthiness. And at first she doesn't get it, and then she does. So it's a happy ending, and she's sitting on a hill with uh, Aaron Eckhart, and we don't see them get married or so on, but hopefully there's a happy ending there that's intended. And she is asked by her fiancé, you know, so how do you feel? And she says, I'm not remembering the word exactly, but it's something like clean. You know, I feel clean and I feel good. She gets it and she does come with a broken heart and a contrary spirit. So it's a nice little video. Look it up if you want to watch that with your kids. They did a pretty good job. I thought it was nice and it's sort of fun to see somebody that used to be a member of the church and had one of his early acting gigs in a seminary video. The example I used to use in seminary was Magic Johnson. I don't harbor any resentment toward this man personally. I know he was a gifted athlete had quite the career still around, I think, as a commentator. If I, I mean, not that I follow those things, but I haven't heard it, anything else. But he was diagnosed back in that day when I was teaching seminary or shortly prior to that, and the AIDS epidemic was becoming more known and in the news. He was diagnosed with HIV positive. And he made a public statement Again, I, I'm not making a final judgment about him or anybody, but it was a kind of illustration of what Mormon is talking about in the sorrowing of the damned. Magic Johnson, when he was interviewed about his AIDS diagnosis, was reported to have said, I should have used a condom. Now, brothers and sisters, that is not godly sorrow. That's not, I'm sorry I slept with so many women. That's not what that is. What he's saying is, I'm sorry, but I can't take happiness and sin anymore. I can't take full enjoyment because now I have this illness that I need to cope with or whatever. And it could actually you know, create serious problems. I mean, they've regulated it pretty well from what I understand. But that is the sorrowing of the damned. I'm not sorry I sinned. 
I'm not sorry that this separates me from the presence of God or from the Holy Ghost or that it rejects the blessings that God would like to give me. I'm just sorry that I can no longer take complete joy and ease in my sin. Now I have a consequence that I have to deal with. This is such an important talk to have with our children and ourselves, brothers and sisters. When we stray from the path, are we sorry because we have to deal with the hassle of it? Or are we sorry because it separated us from God? Let's get this right, brothers and sisters. Mormon, in his great love for this people, mourns because of their response and that the day of grace is past with them. The Nephites flee. Mormon is near the place where the records are deposited. So he goes there to the records as instructed by Amaron. In verse 18 of chapter 2, he sees this continual scene of wickedness before me. It's tragic. I did forbear to make a full account of their wickedness and abominations. For behold, a continual scene of wickedness and abominations has been before mine eyes ever since I have been sufficient to behold the ways of man. As soon as he was old enough to understand what was going on, he saw this constant bombardment of wickedness around him. Verse 19, and woe is me because of their wickedness, for my heart has been filled with sorrow because of their wickedness all my days. Nevertheless, I know that I shall be lifted up at the last day. His hope is in Christ. It's not in the temporal, it's in the eternal. As it was with all the martyrs to the kingdom of God, the martyrs for their testimony of Christ, and many over the centuries have been required to give their lives as a final testimony to their faith. But they know they will be lifted up. Their hope is in Christ. They know that death is not the tragedy. It's hard, brothers and sisters, to lose our loved ones. It's hard to live without them. But death is not the enemy. Unrepented sin is the enemy. And if we pursue a path towards the loving arms of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we will be reunited with all those that we love and sealed forever in families with those who have chosen Christ also. I rejoice in that incredible promise. I look forward to it. I glory in my Jesus, that he offers such grace and such joy to come that can keep us going through the valleys of the shadow that we travel in this, in this mortal journey. He talks about the battles that come and the strength of the Lord was not with the people. Brothers and sisters, let us not make the mistake of the Nephites. Christ is waiting with open arms to receive us. We can repent joyfully. We can not keep our nose pressed against the candy store window of Babylon. We can delight in the keeping of our covenants. We can look toward Christ for our rewards, not towards the world. What the world offers is a dopamine hit. It is not eternal. It never will be. May God bless us in that effort to choose glory, to choose Him. Thanks as ever to my dear husband, Chris Anderson, and Doug Larson of Point Digital. Take care. <laughs>